Good evening. We're going to be continuing in the, the laws that we have of official Akum. Um, in a short amount of time, we're going to discuss a, a very important issue. And the important issue that we have is housekeepers in the home. So we mentioned we mentioned the issue number one of official Akum, which means when the when the non-Jew is cooking for a Jew, there are certain things that one, if a non-Jew cooked, even though they may have no kosher issues, such as milk and meat, or something that's trafe, something entirely not kosher, it could still be a problem because of Bishal Akum. But the non-Jew Akum is, a, is an acronym for Avodas Kochav Mumazolos, one who, worship, one who worships idols and, and, uh, and mazolos and consolations. But it's a reference to all non-Jews. So in those scenarios, um, <clears throat> we mentioned that there are two categories that fall under this, this prohibition. One is that the food itself has to be something that cannot be eaten raw. And the second thing is something that would not be served on Shulchan Malachim, which means something that would not be served at royal banquets and the like. So what are examples that we gave? So we said if a, if a non-Jew were to cook for you raw carrots and you wash the whole thing, then it would be considered uh, then it would be considered okay. Even though the carrots are cooked now, but since carrots can be eaten raw, then that's okay. Similarly with onions, since there are onions that could be eaten raw, then it would be considered okay. But there are other things which cannot be eaten raw, such as rice, such as potatoes. If they would cook those things, and those things are also served in royal banquets, such as at a wedding, such as any other type of royal experience, so that would be a problem of Bishal Akum. We would not allow a non-Jew to cook it without a Jew taking part of the cooking process. What does it mean taking part of the cooking process? Ashkenazim can light the fire. Can light the fire, they can raise the fire, they can lower the fire, and that's part of it. For Svartim, though, you need to have much more, uh, you, know, you need to have much more input into the actual cooking process itself. So for Svartim, it would have to be that the, the Jew puts the pot on the fire and actually takes part of the cooking itself. The pot with the food on the fire, that takes part of it. If not, then once the guy started, the, the non-Jew, excuse me, the Jew is going to have to come over there and mix the food and do something to the food in order so that it would not be falling, fall under that category of Bishalakim. For Ashkenazim, again, as long as you've lit that flame, you've started the fire, then it's going to be okay. So that's our general scenario that we have. So some of the examples that we discussed, as we mentioned, potatoes, rice, eggs, these are things which cannot be eaten raw, even though eggs could be eaten raw by certain, let's say, boxers or UFC champion fighters, you know, and the like, but they don't, they don't actually, uh, that's considered butla daitam etzel kalotam, their, their das, or the way that they do it is considered nullified, because the standard way that a person eats it is going to be cooked. Um, <clears throat> so that leaves us with a number of issues. The main issue that I want to discuss tonight is a simple issue, which is not simple, and that is using housekeepers. Oftentimes people employ housekeepers in their home, and these housekeepers have free reign into their kitchen, and they can cook all these things, and you teach them about milk and meat, and they know everything, and the question is, many times people have their housekeepers, and the housekeepers are cooking fully, and the people are not cooking at all, and you're going to have, you could potentially have major problems. However, there's a leniency, and the leniency is based on four different views as to how you can actually have a housekeeper cook in a person's home. Again, assuming you're Ashkenaz, so if you had a pilot lit stove, you're more or less in the clear because you took part of some of the lighting. If you're Svarti, so <clears throat> the pilot lit stove doesn't really help you, you need to take part of the cooking itself. So how can you have a housekeeper cook in the home if, in fact, you're not taking part of the cooking? So there is, in the Beis Yosef, there's a four-way dispute amongst the Rishonim as to what the reason why having a housekeeper would be allowing, allowed that they could potentially cook for you without you actually taking part of any of the cooking. So we're going to look at the four views, and of those four views, we're going to see some of them don't really apply today, <clears throat> and we're going to end up relying on two views. So one is the Ramban. The Ramban says that the reason why a housekeeper would be okay is because they are Knuyot li Yisrael. They're considered owned. It's as if I have a slave. Well, that doesn't really apply today because our housekeepers are not owned by us. They're really, they're hired by us. They're not considered slaves, so that doesn't necessarily apply. The next view is that of the Rashba. Huh? But they're Sephardic. Okay. Let's leave that aside. Okay. According to the Rashba, according to the Rashba, the Rashba explains that there's an issue we have. The issue is Xeris Chasnus. That there's two issues that we have in general when a non-Jew cooks for us. One issue is that potentially our families could intermarry together. That's a serious problem. And the other issue is not just about intermarriage. It's Shema um, Yivashel Chadavar Tami. They're going to cook something that's 
that's not kosher for you, and they're going to mix that in your food itself. So the question is, do these apply when you have a housekeeper working in your own home? So the Rashba gives a view, and he says, this gzera, this decree against chasna, so what we're worried about intermarriage, is when someone cooks out of ahava. They cook out of love for you. They care about you. That's what they're doing it. When you have hired help in your home, they're not doing it out of love for you. They're doing because they're hired to do it. If you told them they're fired tomorrow, if you told them you're not paying them, sayonara, they're not going to be cooking for you. So that's the view of the Rashba, that basically, once they're doing it as hired help, and then that's not, we're not worried about marriage that's going to develop over that. The next view is that of the Ravid. The Ravid's view is that this decree against not allowing a non-Jew to cook for you um, <clears throat> was only applicable outside of a Jew's home. But if a person is in the Jewish home and cooking in the Jewish home, there's less of an issue that a person has. Last is the Hagar Shari Dura, and his view is that as long as someone's cooking in your home, well, guess what? Someone in the house is bound to be helping stoke the coals, take part of the cooking, do something like that. We're going to see that that last view is not so applicable now, because you have many cases where someone in the house is not doing any part of the cooking whatsoever. Here's a clear example. You hire someone to be a caregiver in someone's house. If they're a caregiver in your house, and they're taking care of someone elderly... So they're not, you're not, the, the old person is not going to be helping in the cooking because they're too ill or sick to be able to take part of the cooking. You, the person who hired them, are probably not even home. So who's doing the cooking the entire time? The non jews doing the cooking the entire time. So that answer doesn't work. So what we left with is basically two answers, and that is the Rashba and the Ravid. One, again, the Rashba's view is that um, <clears throat> if they're only cooking out of love, then, then it's a problem. If they're not cooking out of love for the Jewish person, which is hired help in general, so then it would be okay. In the view of the Ravid, which is if it's done in the Jewish person's home, then there is leniency to allow them that, that the whole gzera, the whole decree, was not when they were actually cooking in the Jewish person's home. On this, the Shofan Aruch and Ramah have a dispute, Svarim and Ashkenazim, as to why, why or when we would actually allow them. The Shofan Aruch actually quotes two views. There's those that say it's allowed, there's those that say that it's not allowed. And the Ramah then says that we rely on lenient views. If we need to, we can rely on lenient views. It's not clear as to what the Ramah's viewpoint is, why we're relying on those lenient views, or which we actually were relying on. So, uh, the later Achonim bring down a couple of ideas. One, the view of the Gra and the Taz, is that we rely on this Rashba and the Raiva that I've already mentioned to you. One, that it's not out of love, and two, is the fact that it's done in the Jewish person's home. However, the Chachmas Adam is stringent and says we should only rely on that view, Sha'as Hadchak, which means under pressing need. Which means really you should not allow the non-Jew to have free reign in your kitchen to just cook whenever you want. You should take part of the cooking itself. Again, even for Svardim, who generally would have to take part in some area of cooking, if the person's in the home, if the, Jew, the non-Jew is cooking in the home, there is some sort of leniency that is there. But that would also mean that if you have two of these views, one, you're in the Jewish home, they're cooking. And when we say Jewish home, it means your home. We don't refer to the old age home called the Jewish home, right? Number one, if a person is in your home cooking, and number two, they don't show, they're not doing it at the sake of love for you. Rather, they're doing it simply because they're hired. But oftentimes, if you have a housekeeper or someone that's working in your home, they will just cook for you or for your kids because they love you so much and they care about you and so indebted to you. You never ask them to cook something. If you didn't ask them to cook, that potentially is an issue of ahava. They're doing it because they care about you, and there you have an issue. So ideally, what they recommend is if you do have a housekeeper that's going to be cooking in your home, or even for someone elderly, you want to give them the command as to what they should cook, uh, that they should be cooking. I want you to make lunch for my father. I want you to make lunch for my grandmother. I want you to do that. Once you give them a command, they're no longer doing it out of ahava. Now they're doing it because they're commanded to do it. So number one, they have to be working and cooking in the Jewish person's home. Second is, they have to be commanded to do it, and then you have many leniencies to rely on, assuming that they're not uh, mixing milk and meat, assuming they're not bringing any non-kosher in the home. And again, if you are having them cook in a person's home, make sure that they're not allowed to bring in any outside food, because if they do, then they oftentimes will swap foods in and out for one another, or they'll heat up their food in the same pan. So you want to make certain rules that say, we're happy to have you cook here, but not if you bring any of your food ever into this home. And they don't understand nuance, so you tell them nothing. Tell them nothing. We, you need it, we'll supply it for you. Don't bring anything else. But these are two views that we have that we rely on, even if the Jew is not taking part in any of the cooking. One, it's in the home. Two, they're being commanded to do that work. Rabbi Chaim, Rabbi Nakash, Rabbi Nakash, Rabbi Nakash, Rabbi Nakash, Rabbi Nakash, Rabbi Nakash, Rabb